Hey, welcome to the online weekend experience, uh, Grace Church here at the Norton Campus. I'm Dan. I happen to be one of the pastors here. Love the fact you're kind of dialing into us this weekend. And if this is your first time, welcome. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know that you're kind of checking things out. Uh, you're going to sit back, relax, going to sing a little bit. Uh, we're going to worship God together and open up God's Word to the book of 1 Corinthians, continue our conversation. If you're somebody watching this and you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to come and make this uh, your church home. We'd love to meet you as we meet here. We have a service 8 o'clock, 9.30, 11 o'clock, and then 5.30 every weekend. And then we have some really exciting things coming up. July the 27th, we have a worship night. We'd love for you to come be a part of that. You can hear some cool stories, sing together. Love for you to come and join us for that. 31st of July, we have baptisms. If you're somebody who said yes to Jesus, never been baptized, love to talk to you about that. So you can email us, call the church office. But we are thrilled that you're joining us this weekend. Sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, enjoy the service.
you're a person, you've probably got problems. We got people problems, church problems, and problems within ourselves. We misunderstand one another, we wander from the truth, we forget who we are, we quarrel with one another, and many times we can be short-sighted and self-centered. But the good news is that Jesus shows up right in the mess to take our hand and lead us forward. Because Jesus is God who meets us where we're at and takes us where we need to go. Hey, if you have a Bible uh, today, love for you to grab it. Go to 1 Corinthians 7, notepad, uh, maybe your tablet, phone. So I'm going to take some notes. We're going to jump right in. Got lots of ground to cover today. Uh, I'm going to cover chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7, right? And it can be kind of a confusing chapter. People get kind of lost in the woods of this chapter. So I'd like to thank those who uh, assigned me this chapter, particularly Pastor Aiden, Pastor Adam. But uh, there's some things to keep in, in mind as we get to chapter 7, 1 Corinthians. First is this. Paul, real person, is writing to real people in a real situation who have real questions. And so he's going to answer some of those questions. We also have already said this, there's some real messiness in this church. It's kind of like Christians gone wild in the church at Corinth. And so what's happening is he's addressing some of their questions. He's addressing some of the messes. Last week, what he did was he deconstructed culture's vision for sex. If you didn't check out last week, go back and listen to it. And then he says, we got to rediscover God's vision for sex. I got lots of feedback from last week, right? But you ought to go check it out. If you didn't check it out, go check it out uh, from last week. This week, he's covering marriage and singleness. People were having all kinds of reactions. I might even say overreactions to the immorality that was in Corinth. Uh, some people said, hey, man, if immorality is so rampant, it's just better not to get married. There are actually some people who say, maybe I ought to get unmarried, <laughs> right? Uh, there were all kinds of, uh, do we have sex in marriage? Those kind of questions we're going to address. And then singleness, is that good or is it bad? I'm not content. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a flyover of chapter 7. I'm going to cover most of chapter 7 in the next 35 minutes or so. I also need to tell you this, if you got little ears listening in, some of this might be PG-13, like last week. So I just want you to be aware of that. Now, when you get to chapter 7, let me just say this, there's some big picture statements that we need to get a hold of to bring this chapter into focus. Otherwise, if we don't do that, you're going to walk through the woods and you're going to get caught up on some of the wonky trees that we're going to encounter. A lot of people read this and they like to stay at a verse that like, that feels controversial or that feels like something that I don't understand. And so the big idea, here it is, the big idea, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. A 1 Corinthians 7 is marriage and singleness are both gifts from God. I want you to write that down marriage and singleness are both gifts from God. And then he's going to say this, bloom where you're planted now. In other words, if you're married, bloom in your marriage. If you're single, I want you to bloom as a single adult right now. Uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians 7, just go to verse 7 if you have your Bible. To each of you has your own gift. So he's talking to married and single from God. The gift is from God. One has this gift, another that. Uh, what he's saying is, some of you have the gift of marriage, some of you have the gift of singleness. Then you get on to verse 17, nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. What he is saying is this, don't assume you'll bloom where you want to be planted if you can't bloom where you are planted. We're going to talk about that. A lot of times, single people might say, man, I just can't wait to be married because that's when I really blossom, right? He's saying, no, bloom where you're planted right now because wherever you are right now is not an accident, but it's an assignment. That's what he's saying. Now, that's where you're at. So he says, bloom. If you're married, I want you to enjoy the gift of your marriage and for your marriage to blossom and thrive. If you're single, I want you to enjoy the gift of of your singleness and to blossom and to thrive in your singleness. Now, remember this, Paul is responding to questions coming to him. They had several overreactions to the immense sexual immorality in their culture. And so we see that in verse one. He says, for the matters you wrote about. So they wrote to him and here was their response. 
in light of the sexual immorality, is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now, this chapter is full of textual things and uh, different interpretation things. Uh, the New American Standard, I think, maybe gets this a little closer. They were actually saying it's good for a man not to touch a woman. In other words, they had two reactions to the immorality. Well, if this immorality is rampant, maybe we ought to just be celibate forever. Maybe, maybe marriage is a bad thing. And then there are even those who, some of the commentators would say, uh, in marriage that were abstaining from sex in marriage because of sexual immorality. And so what Paul's going to do is he's going to talk to the married and he's going to talk to the single. He's going to talk to the married couples and the single. First is this, if you're taking notes, write this down. Verses 2 through 16, he's going to talk and he's going to give some instruction to married couples. It's very, very important to married couples. And here's how he starts. But because of sexual immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. Uh, we said this by way of review from last week. Paul has been very clear that sexual intimacy was created to be experienced and enjoyed inside the context of a covenant marriage between a husband and a wife. One man, one woman. I heard it put this way this week, that sex is like nuclear power. The channel in the right way can light up a city, but put in a bomb can destroy a city. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I want you as married couples to turn the lights on regularly. Uh, I think what Paul might want to say is, remember what the, the first command in the Bible was. Do you remember? Do you know what it was? God looks at this married couple, the first married couple, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. Before there was ever sin in the story of the Bible, there was sex. So what is the point? What is the principle? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Regular intimacy in your marriage is important and healthy. I think that's what Paul is trying to express regular intimacy in your marriage is important and healthy. Now, what I want to do is just kind of read through the rest of this and make some observations because I think Paul has some interesting things to say. He says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise the wife also to her husband. Let me just say this is an attempt, and it might be a clumsy attempt, to translate some Greek words and phrases. Uh, the English Standard Version, I think is even sounds more, I don't know, sterile, I don't know. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Uh, the King James Version, I think maybe starts getting closer to the heart and the spirit of what Paul's saying. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Uh, I personally like how the New Living Translation uh, decided to translate the Greek words here. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs sexually. We are sexual beings, and God has a vision for sex inside of your marriage. And part of your privilege, your joy, and your responsibility as husbands is to fulfill your wife's God-given sexual needs. Can I get an amen? Amen. Right? And wives, part of your joy, part of your privilege and your responsibility is to fulfill in the marriage covenant your husband's sexual needs. God has a high view of sex in the context in which he designed it, that being marriage. In fact, if you didn't know this, and I uh, would encourage you to read this, the book of Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, uh, go to chapters 4 through 8. It basically is a love-making scene in the Bible. Some of you have never read the Bible before, but I'm going to now, right? It, it's a love-making scene in the Bible. And I think when you read that, there's some things that you can begin to draw when you understand what Paul is saying here. First, this, guys, listen to me. Husbands, if we're going to fulfill our wives' sexual needs, we must be aware of our wives' sexual needs. And they are not the same as ours. They are different. In fact, what's interesting is when you go to Song of Solomon chapter 4, uh, you see the husband talking to his wife. 
you know, he's saying things to her that are just uh, interesting, and he's talking about how she looks and about his love for her. Uh, it, it maybe instructs us as husbands, you ought to write this down, sex for your wife is verbal. Uh, she is romanced with your words. Gals take time to move into intimacy. Uh, as the Song of Solomon kind of uh, continues on, he begins to describe her in flattering terms as she is, is in front of him and, and maybe apparently undressing, I don't know. But what he's doing is he's describing her and it's flattering. He's telling her about how beautiful she is. And there's this idea of sex as safe and secure, that she's loved, that she's appreciated, that she's adored. By him. Sex is verbal. I would say the same to wives. Can we just say this? That if you're going to fulfill your husband's sexual needs, you have to be aware of your husband's sexual needs. That for men are visual and the sexual relationship is important, even if he tells you it's not that important. And for a man, I think you can see this in the Song of Solomon, sex is responsive. He wants to know that you're into this as much as he is. We get great pleasure from your great pleasure. <laughs> now, let me say a couple things to you um, about this. When it comes to sex within marriage, let me state first, your desires are not more important than your spouse's comfortability. Sex is this mutual submission and pleasure and appreciation for each other. So your desires are not more important than your spouse's comfortability. The second thing I would say is this, uh, expectations, I heard it said this way, expectations left unsaid often go unmet. Uh, I find this interesting in meeting with married couples. A lot of times they don't talk about desires, needs, sexually in their marriage. And so what happens is when you don't talk with your spouse about sexual, how you're wired sexually, some of your sexual desires in the marriage, when you don't talk about them, their expectations, when they're left unsaid, they go unmet. Gals, I'm going to tell you something he doesn't know. Tell him. Uh, probably the same is true the other way. Guys, she doesn't know. Create the space to talk about it. Which leads me to this, and maybe I would say it this way. Be realistic in your expectations sexually. Uh, Hollywood has hijacked this. I found this quote by a book written by a guy named Philip Yancey. He says, Marriage strips away the illusions about sex pounded into us daily by the entertainment media. Few of us live with oversexed models, supermodels. We live instead with ordinary people, men and women who get bad breath, body odors, and unruly hair, who have bad moods and embarrass us in public, who pay more attention to our children's needs than our own. We live with people who require compassion, tolerance, understanding, and an endless supply of forgiveness. Such is the irony or the ironical power of sex. It lures us into a relationship that offers us to teach us what we need for a more sacrificial love. Ultimately, marriage is this gift from God to love somebody the way that we're loved in the gospel. And sometimes our expectations sexually have been somehow given to us by culture's vision for sex, and it's not true. It's a lie. So I want to be realistic and recognize that ultimately the goal in marriage is it's a gift from God to love somebody the way that I've been loved by God in the gospel. Which leads Paul to say that well, the wife doesn't have authority over her own body. And in their culture, that wouldn't have been all that weird. Uh, I mean, it is in ours, right? But, but, but the husband does. And they'd have been like, yeah, you know? But, but what he says next would have been a radical shift. And likewise, the husband also does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Last week we said this, that for the follower of Christ, my body doesn't belong to me. It belongs to who? It belongs to who? Yeah, I heard you. The Lord. 
right? And so what he's saying here, my body belongs to the Lord, and now for those who are followers of Christ and are married, my body belongs to my spouse. I, I love the way we said it last week that Tim Keller, I, I think, is the one who made this quote, sex is this radical self-donation of myself to someone else for the sake of someone else. So it leads Paul to say this, stop depriving one another. He says, sexually, stop depriving one another. I think what he's saying here is when you, wives, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm going to talk to the husbands in a minute. Wives, when you withhold sex, I think what he's saying is you're stealing from the covenant expression, one flesh expression, to be found in marriage, to be experienced in marriage. You're cheating your marriage. I think that's what he's saying. Husbands, can I talk to you for a second? And I realize I'm generalizing and uh, uh, stereotyping, but, but, but I've talked to lots of people. Husbands, when you demand sex, you are cheapening it to be something other than what God intended it to be. When you demand it, you're cheapening it. We said last week, sex was designed to cultivate into me. See, it's not just this physical act. That's why you ought to write this down somewhere. There's no slide for it, but sex should never be used as a bargaining chip in my marriage. A reward. If you do this, you'll get lucky tonight, right? Nor a punishment. Withholding sex. He says, stop depriving one another, except by agreement. So if you agree for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. So he's like, very specific. It's like, if you guys agree and like, man, I feel like for this week, we're just going to pray and we're not going to enjoy intimacy as a married couple. But then he says this, and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I think what he's saying here is Satan's temptation comes in a vacuum. He says, yeah, okay, agree for a time, set the time, but come back together. Why? Because Satan gets active in a vacuum. I heard it put this way, when you don't make love to your spouse, you open up your marriage to satanic attack. I think that's true. Uh, someone else put it this way, and I have no idea who to give this credit to this quote to. Before marriage, Satan does all he can to tempt us to have sex. And what's interesting is after marriage, for some, he does all he can to keep them from having sex. Too busy, you don't feel like it. And I think what Paul is saying is stop depriving each other because when we do, we open up our marriage to satanic attack. I love that he says this, but this I say by way of concession. He's like, but you don't have to set it aside for a time of prayer, amen? Not of command. And then he says this, yet I wish that all men were even as myself, like he was single at this time. We're gonna get to that in a minute. However, each has his own gift from God. We talked about that, one this way, the other that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, we're gonna talk about that at the end here, that it's good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul was saying that intimacy in your marriage is healthy and important. We've created sexual beings, but sexual intimacy is not the only issue in marriage that Paul has to address. There's another issue that he has to address, and that's the issue of commitment. Now, before we look at the issue of commitment, I want you to know some things that, about Paul, the guy writing this, because he says, I wish that all men were even as my, I myself am. And we know that he's single at the time of this, but most commentators would say that he wasn't always single. Paul was part of the Sanhedrin, and in order to be part of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. And so Paul is not married when he's writing this, but most commentators believe that at one time he was married. What happened to his wife? Well, we don't know. Did she die? Well, he addresses some of that. Did she desert him? He had this, this crazy Damascus Road <laughs> experience. Like, can you imagine him coming home one day and say, sweetheart, I had this bright light and now my entire life's changed and I'm going to give up uh, everything. I'm going to go plant churches and be a missionary for Jesus. I think the point is, when Paul's writing this, he's not some naive guy who's never been married and he's talking to married people. And so here's what he says to them about commitment. But to the married, 
I give instructions, not I, but the Lord. He's like, Jesus says something directly about what I'm getting ready to address. That the wife is not to leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband is not to divorce his wife. That's interesting. When he says, not I, but the Lord, he's saying, Jesus has something specific to say, and something specific that Jesus said is found in Matthew 19. Let me just show it to you real quick. In Matthew 19, some of the religious guys came to Jesus. They're trying to test him. They're trying to trick him. They're constantly doing that. And they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Because in their culture, you could divorce your wife for putting her anything. Burn the toast. I'm not happy anymore. Jesus responds, haven't you read? That would have been like, haven't you guys read? Don't you know your Bible? Now, the Pharisees knew the Bible better than you and I. So that's kind of him saying, haven't you read? <laughs> that at the beginning, key, the creator, so if there is a creator at the beginning, key, he made them male and female. We talked about this last week. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife to become one flesh. Talked about this last week. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God, I would underline this, has joined together, that's marriage, let no one separate. Marriage, Jesus is teaching this, is a covenant rooted in creation right from the beginning. The creator's design, God's vision for marriage is rooted in creation. And marriage is God joining together, making one what was two. And I heard it put this way one time, what God has made one, let no one undone. <laughs> I like it. And Jesus goes on. Why then, they ask him a question, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? So Moses uh, if you read, you know, he commanded that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce. And he's like, why? Jesus said, because their hearts were hard. That's why. And quite frankly, it was to protect women because they were divorcing them, kicking them to the curb, left women vulnerable in their day. But it was not that way from the beginning. That was not God's ideal. That was a concession because of the hardness of their heart. I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, and then he says this, except for sexual pornea, immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Jesus had something to say about marriage. And so what Paul is doing is he's picking up on that. And the first thing Paul is doing is he's addressing married couples where both individuals are Christians, followers of Christ. And he's underscoring the teaching of Jesus that in the eyes of God, marriage is sacred to be honored. It is rooted in creation. Write this down somewhere. Marriage is rooted in creation, and it is picture, and it is a picture of the gospel. John Tyson, pastor in New York City, says this: every Christian marriage declares the gospel to the world. And so when we smash this together, when it comes to the issue they were writing Paul about, Paul's principle is this, stay together, even if it's rocky. <laughs> At its core, what Paul wants them to see, because they're asking him a question, I think they're like, can we get out? Should we get out? At its core, marriage is a lifelong promise. Did you guys know that? It's a promise. It's a promise to stay together, whether things are good or bad, rich or poor, sickness or in health. What God has joined together, what Paul is reiterating, what God has joined together, let no one, even the two people he's joined together, let no one separate. Uh, I, I uh, have been back from traveling and stuff uh, for about three weeks, and in those three weeks, two weddings. Busy, right? <clears throat> but in those weddings, I say to the couple standing in front of me that today you're exchanging vows with each other, and the vows that you're exchanging isn't a declaration of how you feel about each other necessarily today. You're making a promise. Did you know that? That when you exchange wedding vows, you're not just saying, oh, I love you today and you look wonderful today. You're saying, I'm making a promise. And I actually state for the couple, here's the promise you're making. 
You're saying, I promise to love you enough to close off all the other options. Mary's exclusive. I'm saying yes to you, and in saying yes to you, I'm saying no to all others. Uh, you're saying, I promise to love you enough to rearrange my life for you. It's, it's this promise that now my priorities have shifted, my commitments have shifted. There's nothing I do in a day where I don't think about my wife. He's saying, I promise that I'll keep my appointment with you in the unpredictable future. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but you can pencil me in. Uh, when we get married, we're saying, I promise I'll stay to work it out instead of running out. It's permanent. It's lifelong. We're going to come back to that. I would suggest that it is that kind of promise that lends to the security that God intended for the covenant of marriage, and it's in that security where we can enjoy true into me see or intimacy. Tim Keller, in his very meaningful book, the Meaning of Marriage, I would recommend reading it if you never have. One of the best books on marriage I've ever read it says this, when over the years someone has seen you at your worst and knows you with all your strengths and flaws, yet commits him or herself to you wholly, it's a consummate experience. To be loved but not known is comforting, but that's superficial. To be known and not loved, come on, that's our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw us. This is God's design that it pictures the gospel. It's rooted in creation. It was his ideal. Sin enters. And so what's real is the, the ideal doesn't happen. So what was rooted in creation is redeemed at the cross. And so this idea of marriage is pictured, empowered by the gospel that we see in the story of Jesus, death, burial, resurrection. To stay even when it is rocky is to bloom where you're playing it. And in order to do that is to embrace the gift of God's grace as you extend that grace to the person you're married to. It means this, married couples, it's the opportunity to demonstrate and grow in the grace and goodness of the gospel in your marriage. Your marriage is a gift of God, and even if it's rocky, it's an opportunity for you to grow in your understanding of God's grace and his forgiveness and his love for you as you extend it, maybe to somebody who's hard to extend it to. Now, it would appear that Jesus, in Matthew 19, gives a reason for someone to break that marriage covenant, and that would be sexual immorality, which I think only underscores the power of the sexual relationship. If I'm reading Jesus and Paul right, marriage is a lifelong covenant between one man and one wife. If I'm reading Jesus and Paul right, divorce is not God's plan. In fact, Malachi 2 says God hates divorce. Listen close. Write this down somewhere. God hates divorce. He does not hate divorced people. Where we got that idea, where people picked that up, he does not hate divorce. He just, I think, hates divorce because he realizes what it does to people, to children, to, to, to lives. Divorce was a concession due to the hardness of their heart and to protect women. But I think what Paul was saying that he is reiterating what Jesus said. If you're followers of Jesus and you somehow get divorced for any other reason than sexual immorality and unfaithfulness, he's saying stay single or pursue reconciliation. I, th I think that's what he's saying. And I want to add this. I think what Paul would say is it's not impossible to reconcile after marital unfaithfulness. I got to tell you, here at the Norton campus, I can say some of my heroes, to be honest with you, are those who have decided to, in a radical way, express the grace of God and the goodness of the gospel in their marriage, even after there's been unfaithfulness. And I think they are a profound picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he's not just talking to married couples who are Christian. He says to the rest, I say not the Lord. So he's saying to those of you who are Christians married to somebody who's not. He says, 
I'm going to say some things under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't specifically say something. He says, I'm going to tell you this, that if a brother has an unbelieving wife and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. Why? He's saying if if you're a follower of Christ and your spouse is not, he's saying don't divorce just because. Why? Well, he goes on. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified, not justified. They're not saved, but they're sanctified through his wife. They're set apart. They're something, they have a, they have a leg up, so to speak. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified, set apart through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. What is he saying? He's saying they're sanctified, not they're justified. The man isn't saved because he's married to a Christian wife. Uh, the, the wife isn't saved because she's married to a Christian husband. The idea here is they're set apart that they, that unbelieving spouse, has daily contact with the gospel because they have contact with you. Some of you watching me are married to somebody. You're a follower of Christ. You love Jesus with all of your heart, and your spouse does not. You are some of my heroes. Because what he's saying is, if they're willing to stay married to you, stay, because they get a chance every day, 24-7, to have close contact with somebody who is demonstrating and growing and living in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, write down this, 1 Peter 3, it's written to wives, verses 1 through 6, living with unbelieving husbands. And I think what he says here is don't preach them to conversion, but show them the gospel with your life. Your children get to see the gospel played out every day. They get to see it in the way you interact with your spouse, who maybe is not always easy to interact with. He says, yet if the unbelieving one is leaving, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us in peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you'll save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you'll save your wife? What is he saying? Well, this might have been Paul's reality. Some people say maybe his wife deserted him because like, you're crazy, man bright light, going to be a missionary, going to change our whole life. I don't know. I'm out. might have been Paul's reality. But when I read this, here's what it leads me to, and then then we need to go to the rest of the chapter. It feels like there's two possible reasons for a Christ follower to somehow cut the, the bonds of marriage. One, Jesus stated that I think Paul was kind of underscoring, and that would be sexual immorality of your spouse. Now, I don't think he's saying you have to. In fact, I think it's a glorious picture of the gospel when you see reconciliation happen even after that is part of the marriage. But, but, but Matthew 19 seems to state that. And now Paul says this, that when there is desertion of an unbelieving spouse, let them go. He says you're not bound in such cases. Here's his summary to the married. Regular intimacy is healthy and it's important. Stay together, even if it's rocky, because that's a picture of the gospel. What's interesting is the rest of the chapter, verse 25 and beyond, it's the singles. Paul turns his attention to those who are single. There's a sense in which he had to address them for lots of reasons. He was getting questions, you know, should we stay single? Should we get married? Should we not? I think another reason he had to address them is maybe for a reason we would have to address singles. And sometimes singles, let's be honest, uh, we can treat them like second-class citizens in in churches. Like everything's for couples. And I, I think there's this idea, it's like, I'm glad he addresses this. I think another reason is many singles can get discontent and panic. And so let me give you Uh, the umbrella of what Paul's going to say, and then let's just look at some verses here. I think Paul's going to say this. If you're a single adult watching this, he's saying stay single if you can. Stay single if you can. You're like, I don't like where this is going. Stay with me. He says now about virgins, or the ESV maybe is a better translation of it, concerning the betrothed, or he might be talking to young, unmarried, young adults who, and some of them were engaged. And so uh, there seems to be a question, should we get married? And he says this, I have no command from the Lord. Jesus didn't talk specifically about this, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. 
Because of the present crisis, I think it's good for a man to remain as he is. What in the world is the present crisis? Well, there's maybe three or four different options. We're not sure. Uh, famine was in the land, and uh, so that brought economical crisis. Uh, there was persecution of the church on the horizon, and so Paul, like in the present crisis that's coming, uh, we're, we're not seen with favor with the emperors and things like that. Uh, it could have been the sexual immorality that was rampant in their city. But he says, in light of the present crisis, I think it's good for you to remain as I, as you are, like single. And he says, are you pledged to a woman? And my answer would be yes. He said, don't seek to be released. Don't get unmarried. He already addressed that. Are you free from such a commitment? Don't look for a wife. But if you do marry, you've not sinned. He's like, I'm just giving you some pastoral wisdom. It's not a command. And if a virgin marries, she hasn't sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. Any married couples out there want to say amen <laughs> to that? Yeah, uh, I think what he's saying, single young adults, listen to me, be careful not to idolize marriage and glamorize it. Marriage is not heaven on earth. Uh, there, there, there's this idea that if I get married, everything's going to be better. That's not true. There are some of... Uh, the truth of marriage is this. Sometimes your, your, your trouble doubles. <laughs> uh, we live in a culture that either minimizes marriage or idolizes marriage. And I think what he's saying is don't idolize it. Don't glamorize it. Uh, I, was, I meet with lots of people, and I was meeting with somebody recently, and they said, if I just get married, it's all, everything's going to be better. Then I will fi I'll finally uh, be fulfilled and feel complete and Write this down somewhere. John chapter 4, Jesus comes across this gal, and she's empty, and she's thirsty. And he begins to tell her her life story. He says, you've been through five husbands. You're living with a guy that's not your husband, and you're still thirsty, and you're still incomplete, and you're still looking and longing for something that that cannot. Marriage is not meant to quench the thirst that only Jesus can quench. I want, I want you to know that. Uh, Paul goes on and he says, I'd like you to be free from concern. He's like, I just love you guys. An unmarried man is concerned about the, 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 the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. He's like, he's got undivided devotion. But a married man <laughs> is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, amen? Yeah, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman, she's concerned about the affairs of this world, about how she can please her husband, amen? Like, that's just true. And what he's saying here, single adults, he's saying, make the most, write this down somewhere, make the most of, your, of this gift to have an undivided, undistracted devotion to the Lord. Guys, at, at our campus, there are some phenomenal examples of this in our church. I think of a young lady who greets people at our evening uh, gathering. Single young lady who greets people every Sunday night. I think of a single gal who leads a couple different ministries here uh, at our church. Uh, one is funeral dinners for people who just lost somebody. Uh, the, the other is families facing addiction. I think of a single um, uh, gal who was so vested in our Bible camp two weeks ago. She was here every night, and the week before, she was here every day. I, I think of the young single gal who invests her life in teenagers and uh, was our craft director for Bible camp. I think it's this devoted, undistracted, undivided devotion to the Lord. He's saying, I'm saying this for your own good not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. But if you marry, you're not sinning. He's like, no, it's not sin. A virgin Mary, she's not sin. But he's worried that he might be acting honorably toward the virgin he's engaged to. And if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, guys, don't drag her along who's under no compulsion but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does even better. I think what he's saying here is that singleness 
is not a second class status. So for all of you singles, listen, I'm sorry that in, if in any way our church, any church has made you feel that way. And I want to say thank you. Your singleness is a gift that those of us who are married don't have this undistracted, undivided opportunity to be devoted to the Lord. And then he talks to a certain group of them. He said, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, widows. She's free to marry anyone she wishes, but, she, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she's happier if she stays as she is. Right? And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. I think he's saying uh, singles that singleness is a gift, that you gotta be careful not to glamorize and idolize marriage. And embrace the gift of being undistracted, undivided in your devotion to the Lord. Whether this gift that you have is for a season or a lifetime. But I think the second thing he says is this, if you want to get married, be wise. I, I was listening to a pastor, uh, Pastor John Comer, and he shared some questions for singles that I, I think might be good to write down. There's no slide for them as we end our time together. But I think they might be good to ask yourself if you're single. First is this, and then I added one just because I thought there maybe was something missing. I think I need to ask myself, do I have the gift of singleness? Like, I need to ask if that gift is something that God has given me. If your answer to that is yes, great. Uh, it might be, yeah, I have that gift, but it's for a season. Singleness is a spiritual gift for the benefit and edification of the entire body. If, if it's a gift from God, then it's for the body of Christ. And so if he's given you the gift of singleness, either for a season or a lifetime, it's for the building of the body of Christ. If I'm single and don't want the gift of singleness, then here's what I need to do. I need to either ask God to bring along a godly spouse or to change my heart, right? So I need to ask, do I have the spiritual gift of singleness? The second question that I need to ask myself is, is now the right time? Is now the right time? Uh, practically, is it the right time? He says in the present crisis, now wasn't probably the wisest time to get married. Uh, you know, the financial considerations, the, the, the circumstances of life. It's not just practical considerations though. I need to ask myself, is now the right time? Here would be my challenge to you as a single adult. I need to ask myself, am I the kind of person, listen close, am I the kind of person that the kind of person I'm looking to marry is looking for? I meet with uh, young people all the time and I'll say this, I'll say, why don't you fast for a while from, from dating and, and, and allow your relationship, your love and your affections for Jesus to grow. I need to ask myself that. Is now the right time? I would say to single young adults, a lifetime of promiscuity is not what's gonna prepare you for a lifetime of faithfulness. And so maybe I need to fast from dating and uh, those things so that I become the kind of person that the kind of person that I would wanna be married to might be looking for. We, we, we talked about that in another series we did. Maybe the third question, and this is what I would have added, do I have a realistic view of marriage or am I glamorizing, am I idolizing, am I thinking it's gonna do for me something it was never intended to do? Which leads to the fourth question, can I see myself married to them for the rest of my life? Uh, Paul says, verse 39, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives till death do us part. So I gotta ask myself, am I ready to make a lifetime promise Am I willing to commit to the process of who God is making them? Am I willing to make a promise to show up in the unpredictable, unknown future? Am I willing to say yes to them and no to all others? Am I willing, am I ready, can I see myself married to them for the rest of my life? I say it this way to couples, marriage and the choice to get married is the second most important decision you'll make in your life. Giving your life to Jesus the first, which leads to the Fifth question, does he or she belong to the Lord? Paul's really clear about this. She is, talking to widows, free to marry anyone she wishes, 
but she, but he must belong to the Lord. Here's the question for those of you who are Christ followers, single adults, young or old now, okay, widows, never been married, whatever, wherever your stage of life, I need to ask, does he or she love Jesus more than me? Because they're going to love you better if they love Jesus most. Does the Lord have all of them? Is he the Lord of their life, not just part of their life? Do you have to drag them to church? Do they simply talk about and say they believe in God to make you happy? I, I would suggest to you, if that's the case, red flags, red lights going off, which leads to the last thing. Will marriage help me or hold me back from God's calling in my life? I love something that Pastor Comer, or the guy these questions came from, said, all healthy marriages from the very beginning, the first marriage, are created around a mission. God created Adam, said he needs some help with this mission, with this uh, task I have for him to do. Created a wife. All healthy marriages are created around a mission. So will they help or hold me back? And he, this is even good for those of you who are married. What's our mission together as a couple following Christ together? Do you have a mission, something that together you're pursuing? Marriage and singleness are both gifts from God. And if you want to become like God, marriage is going to be the context where you have a chance to grow in the gospel as you extend it to your spouse. But singleness is a gift from God. And if you want to serve God in a way that's undistracted, undivided, he's saying singleness is that gift, whether for a season or a lifetime. And what he's saying is bloom where you're planted right now. Father, I am grateful for 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's full of great stuff for us to learn from, to hear from you about. So God, I pray that you teach us and grow us. I pray for those listening. Thank you for the privilege to pop into their living room, kitchen, uh, on their way to work, wherever they're listening to this. And I pray, God, that you would help us to trust you more than we trust the voices around us or even inside of us, that we would listen for your voice and bloom where we're planted, embracing the gift that you've given us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.